And welcome everyone to week 13. Yes, week 13 of Ashes to Ashes. That's right, week 12 just posted. How are y'all doing? Sweet. Awesome. Good. All right. Exciting point in the adventure. You guys have now in your possession. Well, actually, Raul's kind of working on it and working on updating it. It's going to take a while, but apparently you guys have a really old ancient ship. Um, not much is known about the data that you had. Um, so we are going to continue forward to announcing our Tide Change winner from the Tides Change Facebook group. And that's Kier. And Kier's Tide Change was that um, the good doctor, someone comes to him and has his real credentials. I'm going to say, because I was like, how does a monocle detect your credentials? It doesn't make sense. Well, I'm going to say that he, this isn't his first monocle that does that. He actually lost his first one, and they had his first one on his per on their person. So he's like, <laughs> oh, shit. So we're going to go ahead and uh, start with that. But before we do, I want to do the destiny roll. Uh, I definitely want to get this out of the way just because I want to see how much my players are going to ruin my night and my fun. So the start DM's somewhere. pool should be zero, which it is. Great. Let me roll first. And then reset. There, I remember to reset. And then I will sync everybody up. There we go. Should say one dark, zero light. Nice. <laughs> nice. Oh, yes! Lucius. Yeah, but yes! Oh! Yeah. Oh! <laughs> there God go. damn oh, you! Serious, man. You ran the, run, ruined the street there, man. You... I quit. <laughs> hey, man. I'm a, I'm the calm in the storm of the forest. You can't ruffle my feathers. Oh. Clearly, whatever I did to fix my problems with Skype are not working. But that's okay. We're going to continue on. It froze so on the my look, brother. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Say what? You guys are dicks. All right, so I'm happy with this. It turns out I have four dark side, and you guys have two. Do you want your light side back? Because I can give it to you. Light side back. Yeah, the four the four dark side I have. If you want them to be light side, I can give them to you if you want. No, we we don't need a, a title shift. That's okay. Throw back right, to my boy, enough. Chris. <laughs> you pointed in the right direction. Uh, that was awesome. Trademark, Slacker Z. Yeah, that, 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 never, that has not been used yet. All right. So, that just scares me, honestly. I'm not going to do... I'm a dick. I might be a ship killer, but come on. Let's get real. You're going to have to edit that out, man. I, I put I put his shit on blast. That's my bad, brother. Oh no, I'm not it's editing that out. I'm gonna put it in slow motion. Like this motherfucker over <laughs> here. <laughs> and then I'm gonna zoom in on Lucius's face and it's gonna be like all around me are familiar faces. Alright. <laughs> oh gosh. So oh, man. the screen wipes. After the title sequence, the camera pans down to Coruscant, zooms in. Of course, it shows the cloud layer, all of the vehicles bustling about, and then goes in through the smuggler's shelf, which is being diligently repaired by pretty much every business whose lives were destroyed that day when that one crazy freighter drove through all the shops. And it also goes down further into the uh, under layer to reveal a street. And this particular street lamp, is well known to us. Lucius is having a conversation with a gentleman, and standing by Lucius's side is a woman named Paris who's got her disruptor pistol pointed at that guy who's also pointing his at her. They have a conversation, and as it turns out, it ends well. The Black Sun operative gives Lucius information on how he will be found, turns around and leaves, and Lucius and Paris depart. The sidewalk is now empty. The camera lowers down to sidewalk level. So it's right at ground level. And you see a car pull up. 
And out of the car, these polished dress shoes hit the pavement. And then another set hits the pavement. And they're walking towards the doctor's office with the trench coats swaying at the bottom. They open the door, and just like when Lucius went in, you hear the bells. bing a ding a ding a ding There's a bunch of injured people and such. Um, recuperating and very high in the corner um, is somebody who just came out of surgery. At this time, the Corsac boys, they're still in recovery. So they're not out here to see this. The two gentlemen wearing... Um, they're kind of like sunglasses step up to the receptionist and then raise their finger and hit a button and you realize what it really is is it's a hologram over the eyes that they can darken because of the bright lights and then make transparent when they want to make eye contact with somebody so they're not real eyeglasses and the receptionist looks up and says uh yes can i help you one of them clears their throat <clears throat> listen uh sweetheart We've been looking for this gentleman. Do you know where he is? And they show her a picture of the good doctor. And uh, it's him standing next to a Wookiee who is shamefully carrying a box of stems back to his bunk. And the lady says, oh, oh yes, that's the good doctor. Ah, great. Um, I'm going to need to see him, please. Uh, we have an appointment. She goes, oh, okay. Uh, let me go see if he's out of surgery. She runs back. Uh, doctor, somebody's here to see you. Two men. Mm, yes, I'll, I'll, all right, send him back. Send him back. I'll talk to them. And he adjusts his monocle, turns on his heels as they walk in. And he sees through the coat the strange outline of the first model of the monocle that he bought. And if Amon Calamari's eyes could pop out of their head any more than they already have, his would have. It would have looked like googly eye goggles. Uh, because he was clearly very shocked. The coloration in his eyes changed and his skin got purple around the gills. Ah, I see you recognize us. No, I have no idea who you are. But I recognize what you carry. They look at each other confused, and then one of them touches their blaster. He's like, no, not the weapons, the monocle. Ah, oh, yes. Um, actually, that's why we're here to see you. We came as soon as we could. Mm -hmm. Tell me more. We have someone who's been tragically injured, and we need your help rescuing him. But it's off-world. We're willing to cover all the costs... But we heard you might be the only person who could help him. Well, of course. I mean, uh, I've got doctors who can handle the patients here. I, I could put some of them in charge. And uh, Where are we going? And they hand him a business card. Felucia. And then the screen wipes. <laughs> Serious, what are you doing at this moment? Um, I'm preparing to leave my office on the Phoenix Rising. All right, so, uh, I imagine this scene almost like you're, you're walking out of your house to go to work and you're turning around and you're locking it. I know that's not exactly what you're doing, but you open the door to your office and Grick looks exasperated and he's been standing there waiting for you. And I kind of crook my head and I say, Crick, you know you can knock or just walk in if you wish. Uh, you know, it's not important. It's not important. Uh, it's things that are bothering me, but I'll live. I'll live. I'm going to put my hand on his shoulder and say, come. I have the time for you. Let us talk. I, I feel really stupid about... He even having a problem with this, honestly. And he walks in, and you notice that... And you didn't requisition this for him. This is something that he had on his person. He's got this really high-quality armband that's got the, the universal galactic symbol of a medical officer. It's not going to be a red cross, but it's going to be something... You know, the like the cross and the snakes for uh, medical? Uh -huh. 
it's going to be a lot like that. Worldwide known, galaxy wide known, um, and it's made out of a durable leather. It's very clean, but around it, it has pockets for different tools. He's got a small little torch for cutting into, you know, scar tissue. He's got a small little scalpel, three slots for stem packs. He's armed and ready to go in case somebody gets hurt. Every time you see him, he looks more and more like a doctor. And now that you look at him, you realize he's also wearing a white sleeveless robe. Um, which is a very common practice for doctors out in outer space that are working on rigs. Because you don't want to get your robe caught on any of the machinery. But he's wearing a very slim, very futuristic looking white robe. It's scalloped in the back. I don't know if you guys know what that means, but it looks like it's got a bunch of ridges that, that build a plated spine that goes down the back. The buttons are polished, and he's wearing polished boots. He's abandoned, it appears, everything that is Grick. Except when he motions to go in your office, you do notice he is still armed with his pistol. <laughs> and I'll say, um, please have a seat, my friend. I know you're troubled, but you look well. What 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 is it that's bothering you? <sighs> Thank you immensely for all of the supplies that you gave me. I couldn't I couldn't appreciate it more. But we have a need of stem packs. I think this crew needs an abundance of them. I had <laughs> ten set aside for emergencies but that goddamn thing keeps undoing all of my organizational work then when I ask it why it sits there and retorts that my organizational methods are not efficient in an emergency environment I'm gonna look at him with a with a very uh, accepting and uh friendly friendly face and smile uh, and I'm going to say uh, <laughs> I assure you we will be resupplying our stem packs uh, very shortly before we set out for sure uh, now in regards to the, the droid um, he is your, your nurse uh, should he not have the spare supplies where he wishes them Grick stares at you, his black orbs unblinking. He does not say a damn word. Okay, after a, after a brief moment, I'll say, of course, of course, you're in charge of the medical bay. If you do not wish him to be in charge of that task, we can have Kier eliminate that from his protocols, and uh, you know he will not. He stands up on the chair, flips his robe over, and pulls his pants down and shows you one of his ass cheeks. That has <laughs> these... <laughs> <laughs> that has, well, you look away at first, but you notice he's got these little bites all over his butt. And I'll say, is the droid abusing you, Greg? Uh, abusing? I, I'm not going to get abused by a droid. Abuse. Look, all I did was I hit it with a medical cane, and it chased me around the lab three or four times, zapping my ass. Every time I hear that fucker rolling around, I take cover. This is a hostile work environment. I think we may need to memory wipe the droid. I'll have Kia take a look at it. No! And If you memory wipe it, he'll forget everything I taught him. I will have to start over from ground fucking zero. Do you know what the problem is? He's Should we remove astromech. the shock arm? Well, I no. can't change his core. That's my is, point. Greg. Who the hell thought he should be a nurse to begin with? That's like finding a veteran who had their legs blown off in the war and asking them to run in the Galactic Olympics. It don't make no sense. I sympathize with your situation, but, Greg. Hang on, I'm getting a message. He pulls out one of those, like, comm links from the original A New Hope movie. Yeah. And you hear an R2 unit, like twerting, beeping, booping, and whistling. And then he's like, you little shit. I told you not to touch us. I've got to go there right now. He hung up on me. Don't you hang up on me. Don't you? Oh, wait. Yeah. 
and he pops the comm link into his sleeve, and he's like, You know what? What I really came here for is that Kira needs to go down there and lube up his wheels. He's got this squeak every third rotation. This squeak in one of the wheels. It's driving me crazy. Sounds like somebody's got an old, ancient pulley winch, and they're just going every time I ask him to stop. It's driving me nuts! He turns around and leaves your office. Thanks for the talk. Serious, I feel much better. Stans! Good to see you, Greg. <laughs> and uh, as soon as he leaves, I'm just like, oh. at least he's not drinking anymore. Uh, Travis well, interrupts. Okay. That's probably because the R2 unit has hidden all of the alcohol in the medical bay. I do believe that is actually why Greg is upset. Oh, well. With the droid leaving marks on his ass like that, I suppose he needs a, a drink. I don't think Grick actually mentioned that the alcohol was for him. And Grick's point of view is that the alcohol is for the patients to clean infected wounds and that the droid doesn't believe him. I'm not sure we're talking about the same type of alcohol here. But nevertheless... Uh, uh, I have seen many messages. people still get drunk off of that alcohol, sir. I suppress a... A choke, because I don't even like regular alcohol. That sounds nasty. I say, well, it's no... no you do notice something, taste. by the way. Travis's voice sounds a little more fluid. Not so... Hello, Sirius. I am glad you are oh, able like to ship. Oh, like from the repairs and everything? Yeah, like... Like, Raul was like, well, why'd they choose this voice and gave him a different one? Oh, okay. Okay. That's fine. Wait, that has an implication. Does that mean we could change the voice to whatever we want? Yes. We'll discuss that later. Just put that on the list. <laughs> You're like, hot female computer. <laughs> Hi, but like, my name's oh, It always talks to, to Grick in a different and more annoying way. Cause, <laughs> it, yeah. it beeps at him like an astromech. And he's like, ah! <laughs> Oh, that poor bastard. And I, I was joking. We love Grant. I know. So, Sirius, it's a brand new day. And on your desk is the yellow form that rules gives to all the people when work is completed that has the authentication number should you get pulled over or go to a hangar that says this ship is space worthy. So as I as I look at the paper, um, slide it across the desk and add it to uh, where it's appropriately filed and, and put it put it away where it goes. Uh, I say to myself, "Well, perhaps we won't crash this one immediately into a planet and have to sneak our way off. At least, hopefully, we'll make it to two or three planets first. <laughs> So, Sirius, what is the first thing on your agenda as captain of the newly named Phoenix Rising? Well, um, is this the day that the Huts have given us for a deadline, or do we have more time until then? She's planning to meet with you guys tonight for dinner. Okay, good. So, uh, my plan is to uh, just touch base with the crew, let them know. Uh, the plan, and uh, just have everything get prepared for for launch for us to set off from the planet. Because we've already discussed everything, um, right? But we just need to get together and say, you know, here's what, here's the last few hours plan, what we're gonna do. Right. Yeah. My audience is definitely gonna want to know what your guys' plans are. So for sure. So uh, I take it you assemble the crew then. Yes. News team assemble. <laughs> yeah, so you you can just grab the PA and be like, Poof, and message everybody. Yep. Um. Crewmen, gather together in the in the docking bay. We shall begin our work. <laughs> Kira's late. Kira comes up. Crewmen. Serious, you're gonna have to work on that. Click. 
Yeah, Dad, that's totally lame. Click. <laughs> Dad. Other than 65 year old guys telling the young guy, dude, you need, you need to step No, no. A voice follows you. Sarah says, yeah, Dad, that's lame. As over the comms. <laughs> I smile. So, uh. And I head to the. Head to the Exit docking. Grod, place. where are you when you get this message? I think Grod's. He's in the hangar bay. Um. He just picked up a blaster rifle. So he's probably just, you know, scoping it out, aiming it, you know, sighting everything in. Hey, Grod. Was it? God. It's Grig. What's up, Grig? That robot giving you trouble again? Yeah, you want to do some target practice like we used to? We used to set the bottles or the cans up on the crates. This is going to be a big can. Think you can uh, how, do me the favor? How big a can? What are we talking, like Astromech size? Yeah, it's got like, I don't know, th three legs. Really annoying cylinder-shaped head that spins around. I tell you what, you get it set up, I gotta go meet with Sirius when we In get back. In the docking bay, right? He looks around where you are. Oh, you're here! Oh, you call the, oh that's I did call the docking bay. Alright, after the meeting, we'll discuss it. He gets this look as if he just zoned out past you. And he's like, God, I don't think you understand what it's like to have a the dead, soulless gaze of a droid stare at you. Everything you do, judging you, reminding you about everything. And then I'll just grab Rick by the <laughs> by the shoulders, and I'll be like, "Buddy, if we can get you a medical droid, we'll get you a medical droid." Okay? No. Will you be I'll happy? I learned to deal with this. He turns around and walks towards the medical bay and stops for a moment and turns. Did you know yesterday, while I was eating my sandwich, he reminded me that it was precisely 24 hours ago that I had diarrhea. He's tracking my bowel movements, Grod. Hey, just be happy somebody's tracking your bowel movements, buddy. Yeah, but I always imagine it'd be a hot twee lick. Maybe as a brack, sexy horns. Well... We can't always get what we wish for, buddy. Uh, the ironic thing is, I've got the same wounds from that damn droid that I did from all those women back there and madams. And he rubs his ass and just... <laughs> oh, wait, he stops and goes, Oh, yeah, I'm supposed to be here for the meeting. Not used to being part of a group. Do you think you should have that out during the meeting? He points to your gun. Well, I'm kind of working on it. I mean, it's a meeting. I think these guys know that I have it. Yeah, yeah, but shouldn't you yeah. be focused on the meeting? Yeah, yeah, I'm waiting for everybody to come down. Ah, fair enough. Can I shoot it? <laughs> yeah, why not? <laughs> he grabs it and he turns around and starts <laughs> heading towards the med bay. No, no, I'll, I'll run back after him and, uh, <laughs> like, grab I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and you see, like, his little proboscis, like, frowns. He's like, oh. like, Grick, I'm really worried about you, buddy. Yeah, I just haven't had any sleep. Go Fucker, over there, damn. Fucker never I sleeps. You, just, you just gotta relieve some tension, buddy. Just no, no I'm not going back there. What mm -hmm. No. No. I know when I'm not wanted. And he kind of like just sits down on a crate and waits for the meeting. So we'll pan the scene over to Kier. Kier, where are you and what are you doing when you get the message for the meeting? That, uh, <clears throat> uh, yeah, Kier's back in maintenance, just checking out the engineering and making sure that all the, uh, all the, we just recently had a new uh, uh, Raul started installed a a new and better hyperdrive in into the system, so I'm double checking all the all the diagnostics and everything. 
And when he hears Sirius come on, he just kind of like, oh boy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's like, he, he sets down his data pad. <laughs> I, I think once you, way out. once you walk out and you start heading uh, into the hallway, Kyle Katarn swings around the corner. Hey, uh, I, I heard you guys were going to have a meeting. You mind if I crash it? I'm just going to listen in. I got to talk to Sirius afterwards. Oh, you, you, okay. Um, what do you need to, you just need a location to do it in? No, I or you just want to follow you, ship. listen oh, okay. to the meeting, and then talk to Sirius afterwards. I'm asking if I can walk with you. Should be all right. He, he doesn't have any problem with it. Yeah, you, you turn know, around and do, start. Just, he, he's not wearing. He's not wearing his 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 helmet, and his his uh the arc welder that pack that he normally carries as part of his mechanic suit is also back in maintenance. So they're they're like actually stored in the maintenance area. The only thing he's carrying is his sidearm, and. Uh, and it's, and he just strolls on down. He's like, sure, come on, no big deal. So excellent. All right, Lucius, where are you when you get the call to meeting? Lucius is sitting in the the cockpit, getting pre-flights done, doing all the final checks on the engines, making sure everything's tip top, making sure astrogation's working, all systems are go before we launch tomorrow serious quick question would you allow people who have befriended the ship to enter the ship if they wanted to speak to you or would they have to wait outside uh depending on who they are they can come in kyle has permission right uh, like you know the madam would have permission Rawl, obviously probably even Qualky. okay within reason as long as you know there are clearly their affiliations are Legit. They should have a fucking reason to be here, you know, like Cooper. Right. He, he can come and go as he... Not that he's moving around, but should he should he find the strength to stand and walk <laughs> somewhere? Yeah, so Lucius, you're getting ready for takeoff. Looking at all the, the flight manifests. And you hear a knock on the archway in the cockpit. And Lucius will... Uh, as he's looking at the screen, will just kind of turn around and look. It's Paris. She's smiling at you. And oh, for the first oh. time, she's not wearing armor. And oh, she's not oh. as buff as the armor makes her look. She's actually just wearing nice street clothes. Nothing slutty like a, a, a normal blouse, you but, know. Some tight slacks with pinstripes, maybe. So if you're into that bitch DA look, right down your alley. <laughs> no but uh <laughs> she she gives you that because we decided earlier by the way you two with the way i've described her just so the audience knows because i keep getting people go man we gotta see a picture of this chick she's natalie dormer from what's that one movie tom cruise is in something tomorrow day after tomorrow i don't know sci-fi movie where he keeps reliving the same day in the stupid exosuit you know what i'm talking about so it's her from that movie natalie dormer do you is that the Game of Thrones? The one with the Thrones. Yeah, it's the one with the vines on her head from that movie. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Am I crazy? Yeah, I think you're talking about a different movie, brother. It must be a different movie. I'm getting it mixed up. Anyway, it's uh, yeah. Oh, now you did it. Now you did it. Uh, so anyway, it's Natalie Dormer looking chick with shaved head. Sorry, brother. Oh, I'm an idiot. <laughs> yeah, it's a different chick in, in that movie. No, it's the same chick. It's just she did it for mocking Jay. How did I get my stupid freaking movie mixed up? That with sounds that. Like, that makes more sense. Someone from the Capitol would, would have that, yeah. Anyway. So, anyway, it's her from Mocking Jay. I don't even fucking okay. remember that movie. To be honest, yeah. But after the first one, I'm like, uh, 
I was like, oh, it's another teen romance flick. Uh, Sorry, y'all got me so, talking about movies. I love movies. We got to get back on track. Now, yeah, she she comes in and she smiles at you, and she gives that classical dormer smile that she's so famous for. So, has he thought about it? Thought about what? And he's kind of like trying to remember real quick. Remember, I had asked if he if he required I could go with you guys. Oh, oh, serious. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. I don't think he's gotten back to me, but um, I'll ask him. I've got to go down there and have a meeting. So, um, actually, you know what? Why don't you come along? You can talk to him himself. Sounds good. She turns around and kind of waits for you to stand up. She doesn't just presumptuously walks through your ship and leads you to the hangar bay. <laughs> um, All right. And she reaches into her little side satchel that she has and pulls out a flask and hands it to you. Ah, uh, this is the remainder of that glass that you left behind in the bar that night. Thought you might want it. Ah. Uh, yeah, thank you. And he'll open it up, take a swig, hand it back to the flask back to him as he's twisting it, and then he'll say to Travis, she Travis, um... Can she kind of all the uh, systems for me. Oh, go ahead. She kind of waves her hand dismissively, like, and then goes, "I don't want alcohol in the breath when I talk to him. I consider this a job opportunity." Oh, oh okay. And he'll put it and just put it in. Travis, uh, his jacket for now. Corpse, you know my position on this ship is to man a station when someone is absent. I can operate the cockpit. It will leave me away from being able to do any other duties for you folks, but I can make sure that everything's running down the checklist just fine. Uh, okay, Travis. Um, keep it as minimal as possible so you're not overloading yourself too much, but yeah, continue with the systems checkout, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you. I am old, but I am not that old. I appreciate your concern, though. Uh, now, out of that. character, just so you guys know, you can still have a conversation with him, but if you wanted him to bring up a hologram or something, he won't be able to do that for you. Yeah, so, uh, Sirius, you get there when you see Grodd and Grick waiting. Oh, I'm sorry, Sirius, did you want to go do anything on your way to the uh, docking platform? Like, go get your daughter? Because your daughter's not going to go unless invited. Um, yeah, I would poke my head in uh, wherever uh, they they might be. The if in case Asha's here as well, uh, I don't want I don't want them to feel excluded. So I'll make sure that if they're on the ship, that they know that they're they're welcome to come as well. Yeah, there's like a a diplomats' quarters on this ship. Like none of you guys right. have claimed this room. It's like VIP. And um, I mean that isn't that my isn't that my shit? We're no, playing. you have your own. You have a you have a oh, captain's a cap okay. like. You have a captain's cabin that is actually more of an apartment than a bedroom. Um, yeah, so you walk into the diplomat's office uh, or guest room, and your daughter's there, but your wife isn't. And there's a duffel bag packed next to the bed. And she appears up. to be uh, watching the hollow net. And uh, I'll just poke my head in and I'll say, Are you coming? Oh, Dad! Oh, to the meeting? I didn't know I was invited. You came to the other meeting. You're part of the crew now. Come on. Dad, check this out. Th th this is big. Then go in and I'll look at it. Uh, it's a news report that the New Republic is uh, proudly announcing that they've systematically destroyed an Imperial outpost on Tatooine. And I... Uh diplomatically and with all my discipline and everything uh, hide my pre-knowledge about this because this is this is all the stuff that's troubling Sirius in the back of his head man these these machinations of these forces moving um, you know he he's learned that there's a uh, the star's end has returned to the galaxy and has returned to Tatooine without us so um that's that's troublesome. You know. 
She's, that that, that she, our uh, actions could have caused this tragedy because we were the ones that that originally went to went there in in the ship, you know. She puts her hands on the glass that's kind of got the screen on it. She says, "No, Dad, that's the place I was taken to first before I went to Kessel. That's where that robot did most of the experiments on me." Yes, that's um, that's troubling indeed. Do you? I know we've gone over what you can remember of Paradise, but is there other places you can remember being besides ta this facility or Kessel, Paradise itself? She shakes her head. I was sent to Kessel's punishment because I wasn't doing what they wanted me to. And I'll uh, I'll pull her closer, you know, pull her up to my hip because I'm sure she's like sitting on the bed or whatever. And uh, I'll pull her close and I'll say, um, you don't have to worry about those dark times. Uh, come, we have a meeting to attend. It kind of catches you off guard as you're consoling her. You realize that on her face is pure jubilation. She's happy. I'm going, I'm going to resist the urge to read her mind and find the source of that jubilation. But uh, I'm going to... Do you want to resist or do you want to you're going to abstain? Because if you're going to resist, oh, I, I can make is. you roll a roll. I know what it is. I just don't want confirmation. She's jubilant that the people who tortured her fucking exploded. Right. That's some dark side shit. So I'm going to fucking give her the, the, the father benefit of the doubt. And, you know, maybe, maybe she's not like sadistic and super happy. These dudes are pissed off and she's happy. I'm like being nice to her and, and bringing her into the crew. <laughs> Ignorance is bliss, right? <laughs> Tell yourself whatever you got to do. Girl, it's chance freak shit in her in her brain implants. Hey, cut me some slack, man. <laughs> and she stands up and she says, "Um, all right, well, let's go, Dad. They're gonna be waiting for you." And I think when she stands up a full height, you start realizing that she's a grown ass adult now. Well, the the way that Grodd treats her already lets me know that because you know he's he's a grown ass adult and he's creeped out by her like he's scared of her like he's not scared of little kids so he's a grown ass man. Yeah. I don't know, <laughs> audience, you'll have to agree with me. I think it'd be creepier if she was seven and she was like the ring girl, <laughs> like I know dark <laughs> Jedi moves. Like if my seven year old was doing that shit, game over. You ain't going back. No. <laughs> All right, so. Uh, yeah, she she kind of like holds out her hand to help you up. Almost like, come on, old man, without saying it. <laughs> I allow her to think that I am not. <laughs> and then you're like, and my robe accidentally falls off. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Dad, that's gross. You're too ripped. So, uh, yeah, she kind of helps you up and then follows you, <laughs> follows you to the docking or the, I guess it would just be cargo. Yeah. To the cargo deck. Yeah, and uh, you arrive there with Grodd and Grick there, and it looks like Grodd's having to take a rifle away from Grick. Having a little fun, boys. Now, always, boss. Yeah, yeah, we're cool here. We're cool. You know, Grick, he's cool. Yeah, Sarah kind of runs over to the to those guys, and she's like, "Whoa, nice rifle, Grod." And uh, Grick, I was trying to remember the name. Grick's like, "Yeah, Grod, nice rifle. Can I, <laughs> can I borrow it?" Like. Mm -hmm. No, buddies. Yeah, it is nice, Sarah. And I kind of like turned my back to Greg. I was like, yeah, it is nice, Sarah. I just picked it up. Do you like it? Oh, I do. I whisper. I whisper to her, your dad's paying for it. <laughs> she laughs and she goes, when should I approach him about the boob job that I want? <laughs> uh, I'll tell you when the coast is clear. Not, I don't think the time is clear. It's good right now. She laughs. It's a hearty laugh. And uh, 
What, what do you think, Sirius, when you see her just walking up to the rest of the crew like, Sup, guys, I'm part of club now. Because that's kind of what she's doing, like hiking up her belt like, What are you guys doing over here? <laughs> that's cool. I've done that before. <laughs> what are you doing? Over like, she's super mega interested now. At first, I was super worried because, you know, Grodd has expressed uh, concern in regards to Sarah. And, uh, but when she started laughing, I couldn't help but be happy because, you know, that's just like a genuine, she was, she was happy. That's my daughter and she's happy. Like, that makes me happy. Do you think yeah, she's think... picked up on Grodd being afraid of her? Like, Grodd, has Grodd done anything to avoid her or do you think she's completely oblivious? I think she likes Grodd too much to notice. Yeah, like she's oblivious. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't think Grad's done anything like specific except like move out of like the penthouse and just like not be around. You right. Because as far as she's like, concerned, when... right. Her last memory of yeah. Grad before she left Paradise was that's Uncle Grad. You know what I mean? Like, that's my dad's boy, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and Grad might be a little bit, you know, because she's been moping around for the last couple weeks and now it's like. You know, she's happier. He, he'll notice it, but, you know, he'll play along with it more. Yeah, absolutely. And I think at this, this is the time that Kira and Kyle walk in. And Kyle catches your eye serious, and he gives you this look like, we need to talk. He might even just tell you, I forgot your Jedi, we need to talk. <laughs> like, And I'll uh, just, I won't say anything, I'll just nod at him uh, very slightly. You know, the, the barest of nod, but he would obviously notice. Yeah, and he doesn't seem panicked at all. Uh, and he walks in and he goes, Hey, Sarah, well, how's it going, kiddo? And she goes, Hi, Kyle. She walks up and embraces him. And he says, You getting along with everybody here? And he kind of rubs her back like like a father figure would. Not not like, kind of like a, Hey, kiddo, you loving that? You know what I mean? Um, uh -huh. And she seems to be responding pretty well to that kind of attention. And I think you're starting to realize more and more that it's almost as if she wasn't gone. The way that she's fitting in with everybody. I think you notice that she has your natural knack of diplomacy. She has this innate ability to befriend people. Fucking Twilix. There you go. <laughs> and I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, Kier, you see, you see Grodd playing with the new rifle that you helped him clean up and get combat ready. It's like, like, uh, you didn't like Grick mess around with that, did you? Uh, uh, no, 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 no. He looked at it. Yeah. I hey, got, got a question for you. Um, at long range, or even short range, would you say that the bolt from that blaster rifle is pretty powerful? It would suck at close range. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, so I need to do it in the cargo hangar. Thank you. And he turns around and walks away. It, 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 What's that, like, Grick? Grick, Grick, if you're looking to do something to the astromech, come and talk to me. We'll fix it. No, 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 no. It doesn't need fixed. It needs spaced. And uh, you better be as, careful as you're talking, the flamethrower on that astromech. Kira, as you're talking to Grick, you kind of realize that off in the shadows, like you're talking to him and over Grick's shoulder, you just see that the astromech has been in the cargo bay watching you guys converse. Not saying a damn thing. So, uh, could I, could I give this astromech a name? You could, but I think Grick's already named it. CR3P? Oh, yeah. CR33P? <laughs> Creep? It? It's like sit, it's sitting there in a sewer grate, like, whoa! Is this red balloons floating <laughs> over? <laughs> no, what what name were you thinking, Kier? No, that's fine. It, it's all good. <laughs> Call it it. That's fine. It. Oh no, it's not really it. It doesn't exist yeah. in the Star Wars universe. No, it's uh, it's uh, it's all good. I. I had a, uh, there was a, a previous game I ran, and the, the name of the droid was uh, Vixen, and uh, it was uh, VI7XN, and <laughs> it was great, because it had a uh, ability to, had a hollow projector that it would project a, uh, like, 
in this case it was a Twi'lek, but it, it it had this hollow projection that it would walk around with. So you, you kind of forget that there was a droid there because this hollow projection would be like superimposed over top of the droid. And yeah, I love was, that. That's awesome. So. All right. Uh, so he kind of sees your, your eyes wander and Grick turns around. He's like, Oh my God. And it like startles him. He's like, <laughs> You hear him say something under his breath that he, it, it's almost like it's just a response. He goes, God, Petrie, you scared me. That fucker always does that. <laughs> she was like, oh, shit. He turns around. It's because I told you to disappear, isn't it? That's why you're hiding behind that box. Son of a bitch. <laughs> And then the moment he says that, the droid, like, pops out as if it's part of the conversation. And that's when Sirius, now that Grick pointed it out to you, that's when you hear the wee, 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 wee of one of the wheels. Like, one of those carts you get in the store. There's nothing wrong with it, but that goddamn squeak makes you want to go get a new cart. And, uh, I'll, uh, immediately walk over to Kier, and I'll say, um, why don't you take a look at that wheel? And I'll uh, go over to the to the door and uh, sort of get ready to, to address everybody. Yeah, and Lucius and Paris come walking in. Um, and Paris, as described before, is not wearing the same outfit. I'm moderately surprised to see Paris, but, uh, you know, she's a Valkyrie, so I guess that was an oversight on our part. Because we do have Actually, suspicions about her loyalties. She snaps. But, uh, she snaps a salute yeah. to you the moment she sees you, of course. You got to keep your your friends close and your would, enemies closer, so to would speak. Would we know what her position was in the Valkyries? She's, she's the leader. She, she's number one. Yeah, yeah she's, she's, one. she's yeah. been training the Valkyries. She actually came up with the idea of the Valkyrie and has been recruiting other women that want to defend the, the innocent Rattle noticeably cock the blaster rifle. <laughs> and out of reflex, Grick goes, Shit, Petrie, run! And the droid's like, Whoa! And starts heading towards medical bait. He's like, That was Stand your chance, down. Grod. That was your chance. <laughs> Grick's like, trying to outdistance the droid. <laughs> like, like, Calm down, Grick. It's, it's fine. I'm just... I was trying to get him to a further distance for you because I know close range, those weapons don't work. So. Nobody's shooting that droid. Give it up, Crick. Ah, poodoo. Yeah, and Lucius, you're walking in. Um, I think Lucius is a cool enough guy to know when he's getting that look from everybody in the room. Like that group yeah, of friends that hates your girlfriend. Everybody's had that happen in their lives if they said they didn't they're either lying or lucky but that one girlfriend that all your friends hate they're like hey chris oh charlene oh shit <laughs> thank god i never dated anybody named charlene so <laughs> yeah the only one who doesn't seem to be like having any ill will toward her is um probably kyle and sarah or kier i don't know if kier gives a shit yeah, no, so it looks like it's, it's, it's no big deal. It looks like it's just Grodd and Sirius who are like, well, not Sirius. He's composing himself, but Grodd. Yeah, Grodd's I, I don't betray my emotions. Composing. Grodd's giving the evil Grodd, eye. Grodd's like, cool. He's got his cool face. He yeah, you know, it's really cool when you cock a blaster rifle. <laughs> I mean, like if I walked into a room and somebody gave me a stoic look and cocked their M4, <laughs> I'd be like, did I do something? It's not not intimidating at all. <laughs> not even a little bit. <laughs> she she looks at Grodd and goes nice gun Grodd I thought it would be bigger and then uh, <laughs> kind of just <laughs> she like, yeah yeah that's what they all say alright so Sirius you said you are going to step up and start the meeting yeah I'm going to say um, and this is where we're going to go to our first break it's, <laughs> it's that time <laughs> so the moment we get back from our break Sirius is going to take off running from the word go. All right? 
Thank you all very much. If you liked what you saw, hit the like button or subscribe if you haven't already. Thanks to all my beautiful players, Chris, Archie, Thomas, and Nate. And we will see you in part two. Bye-bye.